Board game expansions are dangerous. They can sometimes add a high level of complexity and depth that kind of surpasses what the original intent of the game was offering. However, there are some board game expansions that are essential to the game itself. They not only make the game feel more balanced, but make it so much better. Uh, Danny, I think you need to expand your board game shelf. The amount of games you have is a little bit ridiculous. In this video, we look at five essential expansions to games that we already love. Hey Danny, I just bought this brand new board game expansion. What do you think? But we don't even own the base game yet. Well, it's not like we were going to play this game anyway. Love bushwalking and the feeling of trekking along your favourite trails as you take in nature and all its greenness? Then Parks might be a game that you've already got in your backpack. Parks Nightfall is an expansion that takes the original worker placement game and drives it down a more divergent path. Its depth lies in creating new branching points along the original trail, providing players the choice of whether to camp or not. Camping allows players to activate an alternative action space rather than doing what the normal trail action provides. This choice creates an additional decision space for players, increasing the game's depth and breadth. Might as well take as much fresh air in as you can get out here in the wilderness. Taking a campsite action allows players to perform actions such as converting tokens, drawing more personal goals, relighting your campfire, and even sifting through the gear deck like some sort of raccoon. Pitching a tent here to admire the view is definitely a reason to stay. Additionally, new park cards introduced include instant action effects that provide a little extra kick in your step, whilst a replacement year deck means you can discover alternative ways to score bonus points. All in all, this Nightfall expansion is no walk in the park. The Nightfall expansion is an absolute pleasure to play. The introduction of these really cool campsites along the trail means that your trail is no longer linear. It's far more branching and the choices that you're going to have to make are a little bit more deeper and layered. I love the idea of going off trail, venturing off to a side uh, viewing point and activating an action using these campsites. These actions really fine tune and fill in the gaps that the original game really didn't address very well. The idea now that you can flip your campfire token back onto its flame side or even clear some of the gear cards means that you can kind of fish through the gear card deck for something that you really need to help you with your adventure. I also love the instant actions that now come with the park cards. These instant actions help to fine tune and give you that little extra bonus and kick to your resource gathering efficiency. The idea that some park cards now feature this brown symbol means that if you've got those leftover tokens that don't really match any of the combinations of tokens in the park area then you can use them and dump them on one of these to gather the park cards more efficiently and finally the introduction of these excellent uh, new personal year cards means that there are so many more different ways to gather points keeping the race to the end game quite tight the way that this expansion seamlessly integrates into the base game means that I'll never play the base game without it again. It feels like I've finally got a map to the stars. When adventure calls, most board gamers will answer. Especially when there's an expansion to a beloved Eurogame about finding artifacts and treasure that's involved. Lost Ruins of Arnak is a worker placement deck building game where players explore different locations, defeat creatures, as well as engage in conducting research at the temple. Being the first to discover an ancient relic means prestige and wealth. The Expedition Leader's expansion introduces a new level of challenge to the mix. Now there are different personalities to contend with, each with their own unique asymmetric playstyle. The captain, who commands a big team, has three archaeologists rather than two. However, his internal fear may work against him. The falconer uses her falcon to fetch trinket and bonuses, whilst the baroness is rich and uses her money to take items straight into her hand. The professor is engrossed in his research and for some reason carries this two-dimensional handbag around which doesn't seem like it could hold on to much at all. He utilises his access to a range of artefacts to have an archive of options at his disposal. The explorer is too busy eating her snacks, whilst the mystic is driven by fear. He's masterful in manipulating fear by exiling cards and using the fear as a currency for further actions. 
This team of leaders looks like they came out of an MCU movie poster and makes the game more sociably dynamic. In addition, the Red Moon stuff in the expansion helps to replace the items and artifacts on the card row, allowing you to see more things throughout the game. Finally, the two new research tracks makes the temple exploration aspect more varied, forcing players to dabble in the local lore and study relics significant to Arnak's history. The threat level in the Lizard Pyramid has definitely been amplified. The Expedition Leaders expansion is well worth exploring. It introduces some really nice simple touches that integrates really well into the base game without changing it very much. What I really enjoy is that it gives you more of what you really already like. More artifact cards, more item cards, more locations and more creatures to fight and also extra temples. I love how in the temples that are introduced in this expansion, you have to defeat a creature before you can advance further up the temple track. And on this side, you have to have an artifact with three compass values that accompanies this spot, meaning that the incentive to really go up these tracks really increases tenfold. I really also love the small tweaks like this moon, red moon stuff really changes how you sift through the artifact and item deck by discarding or replacing two items and two artifacts each time means that you're able to find those cards with those special abilities that help you to fine tune your deck building. I also really admire the expedition leaders and they are definitely the feature of the game. By picking an expedition leader, which takes only about five minutes to kind of learn how to play, those expedition leaders really channel you down particular strategies for you to actually explore. Love the idea of drinking wine? How about making it? Through a board game, of course. Viticulture is one of the most beloved Euro games of all time. The Tuscany expansion introduces you to central Italy, where you'll crush those grapes and convert more wine tokens than you ever have before. This expansion brings about three new modules, plus a whole new game board. The new board now segments the worker action spaces into four distinct seasons, as well as expanding the wake up order chart. These small yet necessary tweaks ripen the gameplay. Now players can take additional trips by using the influence action, by placing these wooden stars on this map, attempting to gain the greatest influence over different parts of Italy. This mini game helps players to gain bonuses and end of game victory points. Additionally, players can now extend their farm board and construct building cards on their farm to tailor their grape churning engine to their individual tastes. These cards provide additional worker placement spaces as well as extra options. And who doesn't like that? Maybe you'll have the facilities to age wine faster, or perhaps you might want to improve your vine harvesting efficiency. My favourite part of this new expansion is the special worker module. The Grande worker in the original game was super special in allowing players to take any action they wanted. Now with special workers, two workers are given special abilities that will tamper with the ebb and flow of the game. Having the power to convert wine tokens more easily or even fulfill two wine orders at once is amazing. The Tuscan expansion brings some terrific tweaks to a game that already tastes like a fine wine. I'm absolutely in love with this upgraded main game board where each season now is clearly distinct and makes the game feel a lot more progressive in nature. Because there are four distinct rounds now where there are spots where players can place workers on in each and every season, this means how you invest your workers across the year is going to be incredibly important. I mean, do you pile all your workers in that first season to hopefully plant those grapes that you need? Or do you stagger your workers out and gradually save them up so that by the time you get to the winter season, you can fulfill those important wine cards? The game feels a lot more crunchier when it's kind of organized in this way. I love the upgraded wake up call chart because now the wake up call chart now has a little bit more decisive and laidness to it when it comes to deciding whether you want to go first or not. If you go later, you get a whole heap of extra bonuses that really help you with your engine, but it does sacrificing your choice for each and every season about who gets to go first and where they get to go. I also love this added influence map. Now there's this whole other mini game where players are vying for extra bonus victory points by kind of engaging in this area control element. 
The actual special workers module is something that I thought was a great addition. I know they talked about the grande work in the original game being a tweak to regular worker placement games but allocating workers certain powers. But the idea now that two of your workers are going to have special powers makes the game a lot more fulfilling and varied. For example, that the chef can actually bump out other workers back to another player's worker pool so that you can use an area that someone else has already used is incredibly flexible. The idea that you can send workers in advance to other worker placement spaces areas in other seasons that are coming up using the messenger. My favorite worker is the storyteller because when you use the storyteller, you place the worker on a space and every other worker in that particular season then moves to that same space, freeing up all of the other actions for people to use. I love that really nuanced level of interaction. And finally, the building cards really reshape um, how your boards evolve. I know in the original game, your original playboards tend to be built really quickly. You build all your little upgrades and then your playboard didn't really have anywhere to go. These playboard extensions now invite the use of all these different building cards that provide you extra worker placement spaces, different synergistic actions, and ways to tailor your farm down a particular route. Oh, what's that? It's wine o'clock? Uh, it's time to taste some more board games. See ya. There are some expansions which just give you more of what you already like. Here Wingspan gets your arms going as you simply just shuffle a whole new deck of bird cards together into an existing deck of bird cards and then you're off on your merry way. Wingspan is a gorgeous engine building game where players place birds into three habitats as they trigger bonus actions multiple times to cache food, plop eggs and compete for the same objectives like some sort of nesting competition. Both the European and Oceania expansion brings a flock of new geographical birds to the table. The European expansion introduces new end of round bird power cards that help players think about staging their scoring or resource gathering abilities. There is a new level of play interaction where players can piggyback off the success of other players actions and abilities. Additionally, there are also cards that can fill up two spaces of the board rather than one, counting double for scoring as well as helping players get to the higher powered bonuses in each habitat. The Oceania expansion brings a new food type, Nectar. It's so sweet! Nectar is a wild resource that can be used to replace other types of food, which works well especially if the dice tower is scarce on rats. There is now an additional reward to feeding nectar to your birds as you place them on these new player boards which have amendments to many of the actions of the original board. Whoever spends the most nectar in each habitat at the end of the game scores additional points, or what I like to call pecking power. Finally, there are birds with new yellow end of game powers which pile on the resources onto your cards allowing you to grow strong and win. Configuring and strategizing how best to use these cards are crucial to being the best bird on show. One of the many things that I love about Wingspan is the fact that there's a multitude of different combos and bird card effects on offer that help you to create different engines each time you play. And I love piecing that engine together and churning those engines each and every time I place a cube in particular rows. One of the fabulous things about the European expansion is it introduces end of round effects which give you extra little bonus bonuses that help to push your engine a little bit further along and a little bit faster as well. I also like how some of the bird cards actually are laid across multiple spaces, meaning that you get to score that bird card twice, plus allow you to advance up that particular avenue of strategy, whether it be gaining eggs, gaining food or gaining cards, a little bit more faster with a single use of a card. I also think that the introduction of the nectar food as a wild food resource which can be used to replace any other resource that you need to purchase bird cards is a fabulous idea. The nectar really adds that extra sense of flexibility. It does reduce a little bit of the game's tension a little bit for me and so I tend to have a little separate area where I keep all my nectar pieces. And when I decide, you know what, I'm not going to use nectar for this particular game, I pack those cards and store them separately from the rest of the game. All of the other bird cards can literally be thrown into the deck for some really cool interesting synergies. One of the things I've noticed about the expansions is that it balances the game a little bit more. In the original base game, players were often forced down into collecting eggs, generating eggs, placing eggs on birds and fulfilling some of those end of round requirements 
whilst the other strategies like collecting food and then caching it or even drawing cards tended to be a bit more neglected. The expansions really makes the resource gathering a little bit more valuable in terms of point scoring as well as using the drawing card method to filter through and tuck cards under birds so that you get more points. Now if there was only some way that the base game could fit in its original board game box that would be fantastic. Love your deeply rooted vegetables? Well now this veggie soup of an expansion is going to become a crazy hot mess. The Riverfolk expansion brings a whole new horde of cute but mean factions. Oh don't be drawn in by their cute cuddly looks, these critters are cruel, brash, brazen and determined to crush you. The Lizard Cult are hypnotizing. They are a cult which inflicts pain and influence via word of mouth. They rule clearings where they have built an alluring garden on them. They can spend their cards, which are placed in a Lost Souls pile on their board, and the most common suit in that pile determines which clearings are considered outcasted, which also defines where the Lizard Cult can then use the Acolytes to perform conspiracies for the turn. Acolytes can be acquired when a warrior defends against them in battle. Using their acolytes, the Lizard Cult player can enact a crusade by moving them from outcast clearings, they can convert enemy warriors and sanctify enemy buildings to replace them with pretty little gardens. These lizards win by spreading their unacquainted love. The river folk are aquatic creatures that exploit the river systems like some sort of privately owned trail. They are like the marketers of the root world, offering their services to other players in return for vicious victory. Players on their turn may opt to spend warriors from their supply to buy a Riverfolk service. It might be buying a card from the Riverfolk's hand of cards, taking a boat ride down a river, or even hiring the Riverfolk as mercenaries for their own glory. Subsequently, the Riverfolk player uses their funds that have acquired to craft cards, recruit, battle, and even setting up trading posts with garrisons by spending warriors of the faction that rules the chosen clearing. It's like making cool business deals, woodland style. By setting up more trading posts across the land, the Riverfolk can increase the number of victory points they gain. The world of Root is incredibly rich, sometimes ravenous, and incredibly ratty at times as well. The River Folk expansion, and I'll also pay homage to the Underworld expansion, which is definitely a very good one to also get, introduces some extra elements to the game experience that makes it so much more fun. If you've got a group of six players who are willing to commit to learning the different factions, then this is a must have. If you're interested in social politics and interacting and discussing strategies and battle strategies at the table, then this is a must have. I really like the River Folk Company. They look so cute, but they offer their services to basically all the other players at the table. And by offering their services, they're able to build trading posts, which then help to increase their victory point scoring. It's almost like saying, here, use this card if you want, but I'll gain this effect afterwards. The Lizard Cult is also particularly unique at developing social interactions because they can't really battle the other players straight away. They need to develop their acolytes and then use those acolytes to remove opposing warriors as well as building beautiful gardens all around the board. And those gardens are going to help the Lizard Cult gain their victory. If you've never heard of the game route, you should definitely try the base game first before you purchase it. It's not for everyone. The dressing of the game really comes across as if like it's a cutesy game, but actually it's a really vicious war game. So what are your thoughts on these five board game expansions? Do you think they're necessary or do you think the base game already does a decent job? Please let me know your thoughts in the comment section below. Thank you once again for joining me for another board game sanctuary video. If you really like this video, please consider supporting me on Patreon, giving me a like and subscribe, and heading over to my YouTube page and watching some of my other fantastic content. There's some board game content for everyone. In in particular, there's a pretty good one called Simple Euros that you should check out. I look forward to you bringing some more cool board games from the land down under soon. Bye!